So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Adam Zelinski. I'm from Koryate, uh, an Austrian news agency and daily news publisher. And together with my colleagues, Julia Pradl from Hubert Burda Media, we've created a wonderful uh, Thunder distribution, and Andrew Melk from Platform SH, uh, who's making us fly. Uh, we would like to present you a use case, um, basically on what we did the last year, over the period of the last year, and I uh, would like to show you what, in our opinion, is the future for digital publishing. It's not PowerPoint. Um, so some rough figures about us. Um, we are from Austria. We have peaks up to 10,000 concurrent visitors. Some of uh, you might know we tend to have elections and re-elections. Re um, so this is obviously an issue. Uh, we have around 100 editors working more or less concurrently with the CMS. We have multiple portals. So it's not actually only Korea but there is a bunch of verticals. So uh, some call it multi-channel, multi-portal. Uh, whatever you name it, there is a lot of brands that we want to serve from this new set of technology. And we have around a million stories. So these are the rough numbers that we are dealing with. Um, so that's why stuff like caching and invalidation and concurrency uh, and SLA will be relevant to us. When we started thinking about the new CMS, um, what drove us actually and what were our goals? Um, primarily, obviously, uh, we are thinking about our visitors. Um, of course, always uh, as well to monetize those visits. So what we want to do primarily was to increase the engagement. We want users to come to our page uh, and be informed, you know, um, see what's relevant, see what's going on. So, especially nowadays, in times of social media, um, where people don't have that close relation to brand anymore, we want to keep, it, to keep it close and to show the users that, you know, come by and you will see what's going on and it's worth coming by. That's the one. Uh, on the other end, of course, of the pipeline uh, are the editors. As I mentioned, it's about 100 of them and they are all writing a lot of stories. Um, but in order to do so, often you have repetitive tasks. So our primary goal for editors was to improve the workflow to basically save time. So because we have a lot of very, very smart people luckily sitting in our, uh, in our editorial rooms, we don't want them spending time on stupid tasks like searching for pictures or invalidating caches or, you know, all the things that uh, all of us bringing down every limb's work and distract you. So maybe the biggest point here would be to minimize the, uh, the distraction editors would have in the everyday's work. Obviously, as workflows tend to, to change over time, as you might know, the goal was to set a technological base that gives a lot of opportunities, but do not narrow you down. Um, then, of course, we have to, as I mentioned, uh, publish the stories as well somewhere. So this is what we call audience development. These are the people that define, I mean, all the lot of uh, stories that we write on which page to publish what and in which order, right? So they look at the people, look at their behavior, um, and again, try to present the uh, most relevant stories to our users and respect the user journeys, of course, as well. Um, and this, of course, includes what we Drupal people might call page building. And coming from legacy CMS, where basically a lot of page building steps would require calling development. So people were calling us, you know, do stuff, but I don't have time, you know, I have to fix bugs. Or actually, I'm doing something else already. And then, you know, in time critical things, again, I mentioned we are a daily publisher. Um, this wasn't very suitable. So another goal for there was that you can build pages without calling us. Yeah, and there's a lot of other things like sales, because again, we have to make money of it, and syndication, which means that we publish stories not only on our own pages, but potentially sell them to others. And there's print, possibly, and all the others. Um, there is, um, 
from where we come from, this whole mobile and desktop split, and then come responsive, and it's very good, but it's actually far beyond that. So if you take a look at the web and how you consume news, or actually how you consume the web altogether, this can be from a desktop uh, computer, obviously, um, but this is, uh, the rate is lower and lower year by year. Um, then there is mobile, um, but it's actually even beyond that. You might have heard of Google AMP, so whenever you search for something on Google on your mobile phone, you see this lightning sign, right? So how this works is that Google basically needs its own version of HTML. So it's the same content, it's just another markup. And then there's others like RSS. Um, of course, you want to publish to social networks and native apps, and well, not you up to chatbot. So long story short, there's a lot of channels we want to reach people, right? There's maybe WhatsApp today, and tomorrow it's something else. The truth is, we don't know today what will come up tomorrow. But the whole point of this is to be so flexible that in this fast-paced, fast-living world of news publishing, whatever new comes in, you should be ready for it, and ideally be one of the first. So in the end, it was quite easy. We have to write a new CMS. Um, and there were a lot of um, things to consider, right? Do we want to do online only, or do we want to do print as well? And among all the products that are on the market, and there's actually a lot of products on the market, from software as a service um, to proprietary, which we had now and are not lucky with it, to, of course, open source. A lot of technologies. So long story short, there were a lot of options. Um, think of some uh, proprietary systems that cost really a gazillion of money, but it turns out that actually we need only a small part of it. So actually we overpay most of that. But on the other hand, we still need some customization. So that wasn't really an option. Um, and of course we don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So if there's stuff like you know, doing forms and, and all the others, um, then we don't want to do this from scratch. And actually some two years ago, there was the um, Drupal meetup in Vienna. And that's the first time we came in touch with Drupal 8 and its OP principles. And from there, actually, we were um, very satisfied. I had a, had a good opinion about that, that it's going the right direction. So there was the idea to start with Drupal. And uh, after we started looking for Drupal solutions, uh, actually, we came by um, Thunder, which I would like Julia to introduce. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I would like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Julia. I'm community manager at um, Hubert Burda Media. And um, that's one of the biggest uh, publishers in Germany, maybe or even Europe. <laughs> and uh, some years ago, we faced some challenges when it comes to content management systems. Yeah, so it is a short story of Thunder. At uh, Hubert Burda Media, there are more than 500 websites worldwide, and they used to run on more than 100 different content management systems. <laughs> that wasn't very effective, especially as in today's uh, digital world, we are faced with new challenges constantly. <laughs> Martin Sorel, he said, technology will never again change as slowly as it does today. Change is accelerating and we need to adapt faster and faster. That's why we have decided to use one CMS for all border brands. So this is Thunder. We used Drupal 8 as base, since it fitted our needs almost perfectly. You probably know almost all of this, but it's free and open source. It's a fully responsive front end and back end. It's built with PHP. It integrates Symfony 2. And it's widely used and highly appreciated um, by developers. It is easy adaptable with thousands of modules provided by a global community. So we used Drupal 8 and added some publisher specific features and configurations to create Thunder. In 2015, we started the first project, which was Playboy.de. They adapted the Thunder Core for their website and contributed some modules to the core, which grew as a result of this. 
And the same happened when Instein and every other border website we launched since then. By now, almost 20 border sites are running on Thunder, not only in Germany, but also in the Czech Republic, Ukraine and India. And also non-border websites are running on Thunder. Looking at the border websites, the Thunder sites generate uh, more than 60 million visits and approximately 240 million visits, uh, page impressions per month. So. so Thunder is a perfect solution for border. Now, let's have a look at our brands again. There are a lot of different um, business models. You have Playboy.de with paid content. You have um, the cooking recipe with a huge community. You have My Beautiful Garden, which is an e-commerce and selling products. You have Bunte.de with video content. You have InStyle, experts for fashion and um, high class. So we realize that Borda is a smaller representation of the whole publishing cosmos. So in the end, hopefully, Thunder would be the perfect system for everybody. Plus, we are convinced that what matters today is not so much the technology, but the content. With the internet, everybody can become a publisher. What differentiates some guy on YouTube and a big publishing house as Buddha is not the technology, but the brand, the minds of journalists, the content, and the connections everybody has. That's why we have decided to give Thunder as an open source system to other publishers. Thunder is unlimited and free under the new general public license. The community will enhance the system and therefore everyone benefits by improved speed and reduced costs. Border as well, of course. But everyone else too. There are no obligations. Every publisher can decide if they, what parts of the development they want to share. None, all, or some. For example, the Courier, they decided to, um, to support the development of a live blogging module for Drupal, which is now part of Thunder. There are, of course, no logos, no ads. Buddha will collect no data. That's very important to um, highlight when you talk to other publishers. <laughs> Actually, there's no need even to tell anyone that you are using Thunder. Nevertheless, we hope for a growing community. We want to introduce a culture of sharing and cooperation in the current publishing world. Our intention is to foster cooperation among the industry so that we all are able to concentrate on what really makes a difference, the content. We founded the Thunder Coalition, a community of publishers industry partners and developers. Coalition members develop valuable modules, use them for their own purpose and share them with the community. Together, we want to build the world's best possible CMS for publishers. So that's the idea of Thunder and we're very glad that Korea joined this coalition. And with this, I would like to hand you over to Adam again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yulia, not only for the speech, but really thank you for Thunder, because I, I think you've taken the open source thought to the next level. And, and the sentence that we are repeating so often, that we shouldn't compete on technology, uh, if at all, then of course um, on, by content. This is actually a great idea. Thank you. Um, so I stopped my last sentence, I think was something like, do not reinvent the wheel. And via Thunder, we actually got much, much more. So now we already have Drupal, which you all know, and we have Thunder, which you might uh, get in touch uh, on talks and DrupalCon as well, which has uh, from media to paragraphs and to all the other things that just makes your life easier. So just the way that Drupal 8 basically has just taken some already known working principles and put them together, again, Thunder has done the same. They've just taken some modules that already work, make a best practice of it, and publish it and make it available to others. Um, but then I also mentioned um, relevancy. So what does this actually mean? Uh, from a current standpoint, when some, an editor writes a text, be it longer, he tends to tag it for no reason. 
which is very tiresome and it's error, it uh, can introduce errors because then you possibly have a lot of similar tags that have actually no relation to each other. Um, but luckily there are systems not to go too much in depth, like possibly Retresco, the AI driven. Um, and what they do, you give them their content and they tell you like, you know, what categories it belongs to and a lot of other stuff. There's linking for it and topic pages and it's actually really a great product. Uh, but what also comes with it is Elasticsearch because it's based on Elasticsearch. Um, now I know that uh, Lucene is very popular among the Drupal community, but I can really strongly recommend giving Elasticsearch a, uh, a try. It is based on Lucene, but it's actually way more than that. Uh, I might give you a short example here. So what we have here, I have to find it somewhere. Yeah, I don't see it, but you should see it. This is just some JSON, and some very rough article. And if we tell Retresco, please enrich, enrich it, what comes of it? Not only does it detect Vienna as a location, which is cool because imagine you want to have locally specific news, right? So I want to see, when I go with my mobile phone to my local page, I want to see what's going on around me, possibly, and group stuff together. It, uh, actually detected DrupalCon, if I see correctly. So within a click, I could have a whole page about DrupalCon uh, and all the other things. What it also does, it does in-text linking. So automatically, within the text, within the article, you have the link to the entity, be it a topic page, be it an external link, it's totally up to you. So that's really, really helped us getting understanding of what kind of content do we actually have and how does it relate together. So. Um, one way or another, it's, it's really a great benefit. Um, and then I mentioned Elasticsearch. In order to get stuff in there, you need some form of structure. Now, again, coming from a legacy system where um, most of your content is, was just you know, HTML, uh, we had to break that up. And luckily, Thunder had already paragraphs in place. So although it was some kind of work, now we already have some first form of structure within the article. And going from there, uh, I will show you some example right away. Um, we had a clear structure again for, for our articles. Um, and there is a question about bi-directional, yes or no. So um, because we already put stuff to the index uh, and had via search API backend uh, views or have views in place that already work at top of the index. There was the idea, why not get rid of the database after all? Because, you know, it's redundant and no one likes redundancy. So the idea was that as we put the structured data to the index, it would be really cool if several Drupal instances could work on the same index and solely the index would be the single source of truth if you want so. So you could take the data from the index, read it and work only on that. It was a great idea, it was almost working, um, except that some modules tend to use SQL, like hard-coded SQL, and that actually killed us. <clears throat> so long story short, do not set your node storage to null storage, uh, it, it just won't work. Um, but as I mentioned before, the Search API backend and Elasticsearch, um, everything is a query, right? So we started using the power of Alexa search for grouping, for indexing, for searching, and for making suggestions for editors. Um, and this actually improves the speed a lot because I think again, we have around 100 plus editors that work concurrently. If all the searches and everything beyond, like from page generation to aggregation would go via database, um, I think this would require a lot more of resources. But then again, going from database to NoSQL or Elastic, how you call it, uh, requires some change of mind, um, obviously. So we had to get rid of the idea that inconsistency, oh, sorry, that redundancy is bad. Truth is, if you have control over your redundancy, you can live with it. So it's really worth a try. I can give you an example here of how this works. So this is an article. As you see, there are paragraphs in place. 
Uh, there is markup, there is HTML, there, is Im there should be images. This is image in German. Um, so let's take a look at the result, how stuff is uh, looking. Oops, that was the wrong one. Sorry for that. There we are. I make it a bit larger. Um, so the interesting part is here, the payload, the stuff we put here. And again, if you reduce this a little bit, uh, reduce that. So you see data is serialized. And here comes the fun part, right? So the paragraphs. Okay, this is a text. Um, this is a slideshow, actually. And here you see the redundant data. Truth is, if for a seldom case that some title or anything changes, it's easier to, to change something else in the index as well, if, as long as you, control, you have control over it. But for fetching this article, it's just, you know, 0 0.0, 0 0.01 seconds. It's lovely. Um, let's put some more to it to show you how uh, important it is to, to deserialize the data. What you see here actually is a very nice thing from the Thunder admin theme. So you have not only paragraphs, but you can add stuff in between. So I want to add a YouTube video, which after I have found my mouse, so there we have it. Right, and I save it. <laughs> oh, it's going to be saved sometime. So what I see here, what we actually only serialize is that there's a paragraph of type YouTube, and it's the video idea, uh, video ID. Why don't we uh, save the rendered iframe? Well, think about our editors that right now page just an iframe uh, into the article editor, and they say with 600 pixel, because you know the desktop article is 600 pixel. But then it comes mobile, it comes app, it comes AMP, and it all crashes down terribly. So that's. I, I really recommend, I would actually YouTube paragraphs to anyways, serialize only this kind of data and not the render structure because it will fall down of you once you have, again, those multiple channels. And then there's the idea, because once we started indexing articles, why not index everything, right? Because not only do we have articles in search of articles and then images in search of images and, you know, uh, agency feeds and all the other things. So that's why I've taken it to kind of a, the next level. And not only do we index internal stuff, but possibly also others. And the result is actually really uh, amazing. Uh, again, remember, our goal was to save editors time. So what we've done here, we index, well, you know, social stuff and agency stuff and articles. And then because we have Elasticsearch, uh, actually this is a very simple query. It took us 10 minutes to write it, seriously. It's called significant terms because Elasticsearch actually does everything for you. So what we do here, given the period of time, what comes up significantly more often than within the given, you know, full data set, say? So this is cool because, imagine this is 10 hours, so editors come uh, to the office in the morning and they want to know what has happened last night. So they click it. And if there is one George Clooney article a week, then he won't have to pop out. But if suddenly there is a spike in George Clooney articles, why well, something might have happened to it? Luckily, George Clooney is okay. Uh, but let's see, imagine this is George Clooney, right? So okay, there's, a, there's an image. Again, I think this is George Clooney. Um, there might be something else. There might be an article about him. Ho hopefully nothing has happened. So yeah, let's take a couple of articles. Maybe let's take a tweet somewhere uh, and make an article of it. And there we have it. There's the article and there's the image. Right? 
obviously um, starting with under admin theme because we did not have to reinvent the wheel. We could do other cool stuff, like because there is a long text. Um, think about editors writing in Word, you know, and then sending other people the text to imp in insert it. And then imagine you want to have a tweet in between. So what we can do here? Which we should do here. Oh yeah. So let's put the paragraph. And then again, in between, you could add a tweet and stuff. So long story short, index everything. Okay, so now that we have content and our editors are super happy regarding the workflow, um, and we even um, provide context to do it. Think about the previous example that we are enriching content, right, and not the tags, but also have a huge data set. Imagine taking this to the next level. Once the editor starts writing about the topic on the right pane, you can make a live preview for related content. So when an editor starts writing about, you know, person A gave person B the hand and they met yesterday and they argued about stuff, then automatically you have the, the current photo for those persons next to it. Um, okay, but truth is we're not getting money by writing stories, we're getting money by publishing it and people reading it. Um, so. One of our bosses once said, you know, what's, what's the deal? Come on, guys, you just write stories, you know, and publish it. Not. <laughs> um, truth is, um, there are several user journeys you have to respect. So obviously, a huge part is people going directly on the article from what we call search, organic search, or from social media. So that's one part, but there are a lot of other bases to cover. And we have a very popular form of, of, uh, of well, entry points, uh, which are called section pages, channel pages, actually. Um, think about politics or sport, right? So Korea slash sport, or stuff like that. Um, so how these pages are built? I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Um, this is how a channel page might like, right? Because this is some politic-related content, think of it. Uh, there are blocks, you know? And these blocks are fed by stories. So in order to build such a page, of course there are several ways, um, but in the end, we decided to use panels in place edit. And why is that? Because we actually decoupled, and now I go a little bit back, um, the layout of a page, which would be, there is a big picture at the top left, and then there is a list next to it, and then there's maybe some advertisement and some newsletter call to action. So these are all the blocks, but this is basically only the layout. Again, think about what I mentioned before. For changing these things, I don't want to get cold. I want them to do it yourself, themselves. Um, so this is the layout. And then the layout, of course, has to be filled with some content. So then again, um, all these developers, they could drag and drop stories like crazy. But then, because actually the layout doesn't change, um, it's an unnecessary kind of work. Uh, especially think of if you have uh, lists that should represent the most commented stories or the newest stories, or most relevant, or you name it. This would be very hard to achieve. So that's why I introduced, oh, actually, um, that's one thing I've taken from our legacy CMS. Uh, it's what we call collections. Um, and actually, collections are search queries, because remember, everything is a query. So the example here is um, some collection here, right? Um, that's an automatic one, if I see correctly. Hopefully, yes. So what I can do, oh, my mistake, to the left is the static collection. Because think about the starting page, top five elements, editors want to craft manually. So here you have a search stuff where you can just, you know, insert your stories and aggregate into a static collection. It's, again, actually a search of those IDs. Uh, and to the right one is the more, um, say, yeah, the dynamic one, where you just create a search query, say it's, uh, you know, based on, um, I don't know, some criteria, and uh, then it's displayed. So let me give you here a short live demo. What I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to build a channel. And say it's about, we call it Drupal. <laughs> uh, 
And what we want to do now uh, is to obviously put some content. And that's why uh, in place edit comes in. So imagine we want to have a, a list. Because lists are cool. <coughs> so I say, hello, Drupal. Hope I haven't. And it comes from some top stories. So what I have done now, I've created a channel page and said to the left, there's a block that gets some stuff from some collection. I hope I haven't mistyped it. Uh, she's not Drupal con, I think we called it Drupal only. Sorry for that. Have mistyped it. So there it is, right? There's the block, and there's some content. Where the content comes from is actually the result of the search query. And this is highly dynamic. So actually, this page can go live, and the audience development has to do, has to do anything with it. So whenever a new article will pop in that matches you know, the search query because it's even newer or has even more comments, it will just pop in. Maybe one more example, and this is why in place edit is very, very nice. You have also drag and drop possibility. So I could put the list actually, I could, you know, drag it around. Stuff like that. Comes in really handy. And maybe I want to place an advertisement on it. And think of it, this is all live, this is all uncached. But this is the speed that you know people will work. And there should be an advertisement. Oh yeah, there it is, right. We are behind Cloudflare, so Cloudflare takes some seconds to do. And that's it. Okay. Um, Then comes the question, because actually right now what you have seen is already working front-end. Um, but because we have spent some time on um, improving our back-end, I mentioned syndication and all the other things, so like you know stuff where we did even more Symfony stuff than Drupal stuff, uh, we wanted to have a nice front-end. So uh, we engaged a couple of people to make us propositions. And how do you actually make a front-end prototype? Um, and this is, again, this is not about technology. This is not about tweak or decouple, whatever. This is just a, the rough idea. Where do we start? So probably you, people start with like rough mockups, which are fantastic because they give you an idea about how things will look like and how they are structured. Actually, more about how they are structured. Um, what content types do you have and how many page types do you have? Uh, but it's, as we all know, mockups not very, uh, looking very nicely. So from there, actually, you can increase the fidelity and then make uh, things that look indeed nice. All the Adobe products, which some of you might know better than me, from XD to, to InDesign to Photoshop, you name it. And they are all beautiful, except you want to change something, right? Like the boss comes over and says, hey, listen, guys, uh, let's increase the font size um, or spacing and, and all the other things. So in the end, it turned out this was just a waste of time. Um, also, uh, yeah, what was better actually was stuff like SC5, which is a style, uh, style guide generator, which I can actually um, kind of recommend, except um, because it solves our problem. You have already someone writing code, it's generated, and it's easy to maintain. But um, as you know, people that write mockups, uh, think about titles, image sizes, they have their idea of test data. Right? Um, so they maybe want to write a title that kind of exactly matches the width because it's looking nice. But the truth is the editor won't give up about it. So I'm sure people write, write longer titles. So that's why it's very important 
to use live data. Okay? So over the period of time, you see already the possible variations and how your site would look like uh, if it had real data again, right? And not only the one that someone thought of because it would look nice. So from there, it was uh, a nice idea. Actually, Angular, what was called two, or only Angular came by. Uh, and we thought, hey guys, let's make a prototype that already has real code. It has SAS and stuff like that. So I can say, I don't know, my variable dollar font size is 14, and I can reuse it. Um, but also because there's an application behind it, um, you can have real data. And from there, obviously, you could build a real application. So that's what we did. Um, something I will come by uh, in a second, obviously, Platform SH that also helped us distribute these ideas. Because if I change something locally and wanted to show it to other colleagues or bosses or whatever, uh, it's kind of difficult to distribute applications in a test stadium. Uh, but I will come to this uh, right away. And actually, the last point is very important. It's uh, never forget to throw away your prototype. Because all the code you write is better the second time you write it. We all know that. Um, so luckily, uh, Angular messed up. And from Angular 2 to 4, which should be compatible, there were so many changes that we had to throw away the prototype. It was very good. And as we had already Angular, um, to all of you who might know it, uh, it's what's called a single page application. That means that once you have loaded the page and navigate within the page, you don't have to reload all the page again. You only can reload the, con the, the content part or whatever is necessary to you. Um, so this is obviously fantastic for our visitors because once you've loaded the page, right, Every from there, every click from there is just two to three kilobytes. It's just the JSON or even a smaller version of the JSON you have seen before. So the transitions, the page transitions, they go blazingly fast, right? Remember in the, in the um, beginning I mentioned that we want to increase engagement of people. So once you are on our article, what we want to do is to easily make it navigable. So you can click around because we all know how it feels if you go to a page because there was an interesting article and then there might be another interesting you click on it, but it takes two to three seconds and you say, hey, come on, okay, never mind, all right, next one. So this is something we want to prevent and hopefully we'll solve using single page applications. Uh, and there's another huge benefit which is called, which I call decoupled ad impressions. Um, again, because we have to serve ads, unfortunately. Think about the whole page and about ad positions. I think about ad positions that are possibly paid only after a specific period of visibility. So someone comes to our page and there is an advertisement displayed, which people pay for only if it's displayed for 10 to 15 seconds, for instance. But within the 10 seconds, you as a visitor already have found some nice articles. You click on it, and that means our ad was displayed only for eight seconds, and we don't get any money. Um, so it's just a lot of, of benefits. Um, again, let me give you a short demo. I have a picture prepared. So let's go on some article. And we have your advertisement. And what I will do now, uh, just to demonstrate to you that, is this the image? I hope so. Yes. Right. So definitely, if I would reload the page, this would get lost because this is my manual thing. So what I do now, I'll go to another article, and there is still the ad. It did not reload. Actually, nothing reloaded except this small part. And what's also cool, let's find the network. Let's go to another page. What happened? You, we loaded a channel page. Uh, that actually was five kilobytes, right? So the whole page, the whole content, of course, except the images, it's five kilobytes. I go to another article. This was uncached, right? No one ever seen it before. And this was what? Um, I think three kilobytes for the whole article and so further. So this was uncached again. So because I don't think that so many people are on this page right now. I could go to another one and there it is. What's even cooler because we cached the result, if I go back, that's it, 
right? No need to reload anything. So, but what else do we have? Unfortunately, we don't have only uh, classic HTML. We also have, or responsive HTML, we also have um, new kids on the block like Google AMP, which again means that um, this is just another representation. This is just um, another, sub, another set of HTML, but fed by the same API. So in order to render HTML or to render Google AMP, we use the same JSON that we used before, which we can again heavily cache. Right? Think about the million stories. If I'd have to build them from database quite often, this just wouldn't be suitable. And what's even worse, um, building it from the database that the editors are working on would, of course, um, have a negative influence on, on, on the workflow for the editors. So this is fully decoupled, right? The editors write their stories back to the database because it's necessary, because we are sloppy, put it in the index, and everything from there is without a database. Especially the front ends you see here, um, they just tend to be Wabi and Ken. They just tend to be beautiful, but there should be no logic behind it, and that's on purpose. So we don't have redundancy, another type of redundancy. Um, another great thing that comes with Angular, actually, and I can highly recommend it to you, is TypeScript. Basically, TypeScript is how they call themselves superset of JavaScript. So what does it mean? Every JavaScript is already valid TypeScript, right? But it has a strong type system. To all of you who are writing JavaScript and, and know the pains, I can really, really suggest try out TypeScript. Basically, you can take any JavaScript, put a TypeScript compiler on it, and work from there. Um, you have fantastic things like um, null checks. Think about uh, most or so many method calls we do, and I think in a lot of, a high percentage of time, the next line always is, if result is not null, if result is null, right? Our code is so full of it, or actually should be. The cool thing with TypeScript is, you can say, um, we have strict null checks. So if a method says it returns an object of type, well, person, I can be sure as a consumer of that method that there will be a person returned. How is this achievable or achieved? that the compiler does not allow me to return null in such a case. So if I say in my header, my method returns person, and I say, well, if something went wrong, return null, you say, no, no, you can't do that, because someone is relying on you, on the contract you have, that you are returning a person. Many other things, so I can, again, really, really recommend it to you. Um, yeah. <coughs> then, because I mentioned uh, Facebook and Google, there's another thing. Um, Actually, when you load this classic Angular application, you would only load the, the bare minimum, and then the application would only kick in and build your page. But think about Google coming by, and I think also that Angular is actually a Google product and doesn't work well with Google, but it's another topic. If Google comes by, uh, they want to have meta tags. They want to have the content to scrape, already pre-rendered. And that's what Angular Universal is good for. Um, think about the client. He wants to visit the page. So that was how Angular Universal on the back end is fetching some APIs. In this case of Drupal, you've seen these APIs before. It can do it asynchronously. This is a perfect thing about Node.js. It has this, this, this cycle. What does this mean? Think of um, you have to make 10 uh, requests to an API in PHP in general, especially if you're on the web. You would have to wait for every single result to continue with the other. Um, on Node.js, luckily, they decoupled it. So um, you're working with callbacks. So basically, you can make 10 requests concurrently, and just as they chip in, you fill your page. But you can do it more or less in parallel. So this speeds up, again, uh, it's, it's really fantastic. And once the whole page and all the API calls from the layout, from the collections, and all the other things are available and the page is rendered, then an already pre-rendered HTML is returned to the, to the browser. On the browser, there is something like called pre-boot, so it makes from this HTML, it makes a real Angular application, it re-angularifies it. Um, and from there, you have the single page application, and when you navigate from this Angular universal, uh, sorry, from this Angular application, we've seen it before, 
you already on, only have direct calls to the API. It's actually the same calls that Universal would have do, but you don't have to do all the other things around it. Again, it saves time, we've seen it before. Um, yeah, let's give it maybe a two minute shot here. Where is it? Okay, so this is uh, my local, I think if the port is 8888, then this is universal. So this is my local machine doing stuff. And if we see the page source, where is the page source? Yeah, so it's already rendered HTML. Compared to my <laughs> other port, which is hopefully 4,200, which is the non-universal app. The cool thing is with developing Angular, you have uh, the Angular CLI that does the automatic refresh and all the other things. So all you have to do is just change your template or change your style in SAS and it gets live reloaded. We'll see this right away. Um, but if I see the page source here, right? so this is the non-universal part. You don't want to serve this to Google. Google needs that, or they want that, they claim. So that's why universal is a great thing. I think React is something similar. Um, let me change the color here. Will it work? I just put some CS, line of CSS, and hopefully it will compile within three, two, one. I'll see. Oh, it's there. It was 92%. Okay, so I made it blue. Okay. Um, so long story short, for local development, it's fantastic. But then I mentioned we want to present this to others. So what I've done now, I've just changed this line. Um, so let's make a new branch of it and call it DrupalCon. Drupal gone. Not really, huh? Oh, come on. And I will, what I will do now. Um, I go to platform as age. So what happened here? Um, I pushed it to a branch. Uh, it should be here somewhere. Actually, it's not. Okay. Oh, it popped up already. Look at that. It was faster than my Angular. Um, long story short, what do we see here? We see a master environment, uh, which is obviously continuously deployed from my master branch. But I pushed another branch here. Um, it's not activated per default, and this makes sense because given you have like gazillion of branches and people, you don't want to activate everything. You, just, you know, it's not really necessary. Uh, but just let's activate the branch. Um, this might take like one or two minutes, and uh, after two minutes, we'll have a nice blue. A font which we can send to our customers. From there, can I introduce one more time Andrew from Platform SH um, to give you a bit more in depth about Platform and you know how it's working. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, so uh, I think what, what Adam's showing there is that what Platform SH is doing uh, at uh, Korea RT is to uh, bridge that gap between what you can do on your local and what you actually need to have when you're in production, um, which is what takes me onto that, uh, should take me onto that next slide. Um, that um, that's what's happening in the background now, and uh, by the time I'm finished, uh, Adam will be able to go back to that. Um, what we do is we uh, give you the ability to clone uh, byte for byte, um, so really quickly, everything that you've got in your production instance, um, and then move that over 
to um, a, a new um, environment, for example, for a security update, uh, a feature or a bug fix, or as Adam was showing for some kind of QA reason in this particular kind of case where you might, or you might want to show a stakeholder a new version uh, of the site and so on. Um, and so what we're helping there with is actually, you know, on a, on a low level, you could say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're making things faster, but it's really about being able to actually uh, increase the speed of innovation or the efficiency of uh, being able to maybe update what you're doing on uh, uh, the level of the design, uh, the level of uh, being able to actually um, get your internal stakeholders or your customers um, the results they want quicker. Um, and that's something that applies as much in uh, media and publishing as it does in uh, e-commerce um, or any other um, area where what you want is primarily agility. Um, so what we also do there is, uh, as well as being able to give you those new environments very quickly, um, there's a, a very simple way in which uh, the environments uh, also, uh, sorry, Git will also contain the infrastructure. So it's actually going to have a, a very um, uh, concise description of what the services are that you're running, uh, the configurations that you've got there. And you can actually also deploy arbitrarily complex uh, clusters there. So in the particular case that we're looking at with Korea uh, um, AT, they've got a, a back end, which is uh, Drupal 8. Um, they've got front ends, which are uh, Node.js. Uh, they've got a middle, sorry? Oh, well, yeah. Um, sorry, I wasn't being accurate enough there. <laughs> But anyway, so, but you know, like there's, there's the ability to have um, those kind of uh, arbitrarily complex uh, um, clusters as well. So you can also have like side by side Node and uh, Symphony, that kind of thing as well. Um, and of course, what's also interesting is perhaps, uh, you know, like you, you might want back end services too. So um, I'll come on to those in a moment. We're first going to just look at um, uh, the triple redundant architecture that we also have, so um, we offer a 99.99% uh, uptime and uh, triple redundancy because uh, we use uh, for um, MySQL and so on, we use a, um, a Galera cluster. So you actually have uh, three side-by-side uh, -side, um, uh, single tier versions of each of your, appli your application three times. Um, so that gives you high availability and dynamic scaling as well. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you've also got the ability to run all sorts of different services. And for example, in a single Git, uh, um, in a single Git repo, you can run perhaps Node and Symfony with uh, backends where you'd also have Mongo and uh, MySQL uh, and maybe also RabbitMQ, some other backend services. Uh, you could also have, um, for example, uh, the ability to have uh, also uh, PHP workers running as well, that kind of thing. Um, and um, obviously, when we do this kind of stuff, uh, um, that's normally when we've got the kind of cutting edge uh, customers who actually are asking for this kind of thing. And Korea uh, um, RT is a great example of that. And um, so I'll hand over back to Adam and hopefully we've got something built in the meantime and we can have a look at that as well. So thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, as you mentioned, let's find it. <coughs> if not, there's something really cool you can do. There's a CLI, so you can say platform web, which opens platform on the web. And there we have it. Ooh. Okay, so I made some typos. This, this is why if you circumvent uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, then this is what happens. Um, but let's give a better example that works. So. This is uncached, so it takes some time. And it's universal, so it has to gather all the data. But once it's there, it's there. And apparently, people were playing around with colors. So, oh yeah, there are colors, look. So that's actually really, really cool. And 
saves us a lot of time. And yeah, finally, let's put it all together. Uh, what do we have? And, um, we do have Drupal 8, actually, Thunder based on Drupal 8, uh, which is like the back end, right? And we have p only one end of the pipeline, people writing to it. We might have a database, unfortunately. We re index things and enrich things and pull the Elasticsearch. And from there, everything is consumed via an API that actually, because we're lazy, is in the same application, but in theory, it could be anywhere. Um, and then there's the front end, driven by Node.js, Angular and Angular Universal, um, that clients access, okay? Um, what else is there? Obviously, something I missed yet, missed out yet, is the, the users, uh, or maybe some other consumer of the API, like native apps. Um, but this is the architecture we are hoping to launch soon, and yeah, make web even better and faster. Thank you. Q and A. Anyone? Uh, hello. Um, I have a quick question about your um, how you work with Thunder. Um, so I'm just wondering, from uh, the point of view, when you uh, I imagine that you build on top of the things that Thunder already provides. Um, and then when it comes to a situation where Thunder uh, improves something that's a, a similar thing, uh, how does that work in like an upgrading kind of standpoint? Uh, that's just something we've had a lot of difficulty with before with distributions and being able to like upgrade from their system without messing up what we've extended on top. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. I think the question was how the update stages works and how coupled we are to Thunder. Um, so Thunder provides you, uh, we install Thunder via Composer, obviously as a dependency. And with Thunder there come a bunch of modules. Um, but luckily in Drupal you can decide if you want to use those modules or not, if you want to enable them or not. There are some modules from Thunder that we just don't use. There also were the cases where uh, we tried to implement something in parallel because we haven't talked for a month, and it turns out they made the same. Okay, mm -hmm. happens. Um, but that's why there's actually great communication uh, via Slack, via whatever, via email, and, and all the other channels uh, that inform you about the roadmap. Um, and if you're part of Thunder Coalition, you can, but not necessarily only limited to that, you can see what's going on and what the roadmap is. And based on that, you can think about what you will implement your own or not. Um, but um, it, it works really flawlessly, so never had issues. Use Composer. <laughs> yeah. Just a question about caching all the stuff. Do you have them in Cloudflare or just in database? Yeah. Okay, everything in Cloudflare. Cool. Yes. For several reasons, actually. Um, Actually, for one main reason, mm -hmm. uh, which is called tech-based, I, I hate this word, tech-based cache and validation. Yeah. Um, so think of you have several representations of your content, be it JSON, AMP, RSS, you name it. So whenever someone changes that content, you want to invalidate all the resources at once. And that's why tech-based cache and validation comes in, Cloudflare offers it, and we love it. TBC on. <laughs> Great presentations, thank you. Um, how do you manage the analytics aspects with all these middle channels? Fantastic question, fantastic question. Uh, I didn't want to, to overdraw this, but truth is uh, we use Google Analytics and we do have uh, the, AP, the Google Analytics API is coupled to our Elasticsearch. So what we do is every minute we fetch analytics and ask them, hey guys, um, you know, tell us, information about our content. And using Elasticsearch is super cool because you can have uh, partial updates. So I don't have to change the whole article or invalidate too much. Uh, I just tell, okay, listen, this article had actually 500 page impressions more over the last minute. So long story short, uh, Elast Google Analytics API is coupled to Elasticsearch. Okay, thank you very much for coming. If any questions? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And we've got a very good turnout. Yeah, yeah. That's slim. Yeah, but that was a great turnout. Fun. Yeah. It went better than, it, better than I expected. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>